But just to give you a little sidelight on how words get mixed up in their meanings, we now have a class of person called an agnostic. And uh, an agnostic g generally means a person who doesn't commit himself to any beliefs about the ultimate nature of things. He just says he doesn't know. But the original word, agnosia in Greek, meant a special kind of knowledge. It was called the dark knowledge of God. The knowledge of God in the cloud of unknowing, to use the title of a mystical treatise written by an anonymous 14th century English monk. This monk derived his ideas from a very mysterious figure who wrote under the name of Dionysius the Areopagite. Dionysius was a 5th or 6th century Syrian monk who had learned his mysticism from Porphyry who got it from Plotinus, who was a Neoplatonist, and who probably got uh, a great deal of stimulation from the intellectual world of Alexandria. And Alexandria, in the early years of the Christian era, was a tremendous exchange place between East and West. Buddhist monks visited Alexandria. It was uh, one of the great centers of trade between Rome and India. And as you may know, all Rome's gold eventually went to India for the purchase of pepper. And uh, as a result of this, the Roman economy collapsed. They bought too much luxury from India. India, in exchange, got Roman architecture. And uh, you'll see a lot of Roman architecture in Indian temples. But Alexandria was the great center for the Gnostics and for Christian theology. And some of the greatest theologians, Clement, Origen, Athanasius, Saint Cyril, all worked out of Alexandria. Well now going back to this strange monk Dionysius, It was he who first put around the idea in Christian circles that there was such a thing of the knowledge as the knowledge of God by faith. By agnosia, really, by unknowing. And he, in a book which he wrote, a very short book called The Theologia Mystica, he wrote a treatise on the higher knowledge of God, which might be quoted directly from the Upanishads in certain parts of it. The last section of it reads like the Mandukya Upanishad because it's a series of negations. It says what God is not. And he goes very far because he says that God is not one. He says our idea of unity falls far short of what God is. So does our idea of Trinity. So does our idea of spirit, our idea of mind, of justice, of love. All these things are not really God. And he says in another place, if anybody having seen God understood what he had seen, what he would have seen would not have been God, but some creature of God, less than God, some sort of angel or something like that. It's perfectly amazing to consider the influence that this man had. For writing under the name of Dionysus the Areopagite, he became identified, you see, with St. Paul's first convert in Athens. And legend has it that he was the first bishop of Athens and was martyred in Gaul, where he's known as St. Denis. But St. Thomas Aquinas looked upon the writings of Dionysus the Areopagite as having the highest authority. And you could, if all the texts of Dionysus' work had been lost, you could restore most of it from quotations in St. Thomas. He wrote really two very important books. One was the one I said, the Theologia Mystica, 
The other was called The Divine Names. And these two books presented the two phases of his theology. The book called The Divine Names was a discussion on the nature of God in terms of what God is like, by analogy. And this kind of knowledge of God he called cataphatic. From the Greek phemi, to speak or say, kata, meaning uh, to say according to, that is to say to speak by analogy. Where he used, though entirely negative language about God, this sort of discourse was called apophatic. And the word apo meaning away from, to talk away from. Just as a sculptor, when he makes an image, reveals the image by removing stone. And so Dionysius explained that one attains the knowledge of God by discarding concepts. Which is exactly what the Hindus mean when they say, uh, of God one can only say, neti, neti, not this, not this, not any conception. So thus in Hindu philosophy, the highest state of consciousness in samadhi is called nirvikalpa samadhi which means literally non-conceptual. Vikalpa means a concept. Nir is a negation. So the non-conceptual knowledge. Now people have greatly misunderstood this. They have imagined that unknowing the state of the highest contemplation was the acquisition of a blank mind from which you first discarded thought you went on to discard perception. You went on to discard any kind of sensory content in awareness. Until you were, so far as anyone could say, aware of nothing. And they supposed that this kind of catatonic state was mystical consciousness. This is often believed in India. If you go to the Vedanta society and ask what do you mean by nirvikalpa samadhi, they will tell you that the one in that state has no consciousness whatsoever of the sensory world. That he is completely absorbed as you sometimes see Hindu holy men sitting in a state where they are blind and deaf to everything going on around them. The founder of Chinese Zen, known as Huinang, described people like that as no better than pieces of rock and lumps of wood. He said it's a very serious mistake indeed to confuse sunyata, the Sanskrit word for the great void, which is both the ultimate reality and the consciousness thereof, that it's a great mistake to confuse it with nothingness. It is rather to be thought of as space, or like space, because space is not empty. It contains the whole universe. And so in the same way, the state of mind of a person who is truly enlightened is not empty. It contains everything. But like space, it is not stained by what it contains. And it's often said in Zen imagery, you can't hammer a nail into space. You can't spit on the sky and soil it. If you try, the spit will just return and hit your own face. So they go on to say the consciousness in all of us, your basic mind is like space. It is completely pure. But of course, by purity, they don't mean unsexual, which is, of course, what purity generally means in the Western world. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. A person who's pure in heart is generally understood as one who never has any naughty thoughts. <laughs> you know what naughty means? It means vain, negative empty 
A naughty person, therefore, is one who doesn't amount to anything, who's just nothing. That's the real meaning. But uh, this misunderstanding of the nature of contemplation existed not only in India, from which it was transmitted to China, but also in the West. You read many treatises on Western mysticism, and there's still the feeling that getting into a deep, deep trance, sometimes called rapture, again, the word rapture has undergone some transformations. We talk about rapture as people being beside themselves with pleasure. But to be rapt means to be taken away from the body. So also ecstasy, we now interpret as meaning uh, in a state of high pleasure. But it means to be outside yourself, to stand outside yourself. Your soul has left you, it is with God. As Arabs say of all crazy people, be kind to them. They're not here, their soul is with God. But actually, if it can be true, as Buddhists say, that nirvana and samsara are one, and if it can be true, as Christians say, that the spirit can be made flesh, the word can be made flesh, then obviously the highest form of man is not sitting in a trance like a lump on a log with a perfectly blank mind. Because if that were the highest state of consciousness, it would be an exclusive state of mind. A state of mind that shuts out life. And in that sense it could not qualify for being what the Hindus call non-dualistic. They always speak of the highest reality as being not one, because one excludes many. Not nothing, because nothing excludes something. Not being, because being excludes non-being, and vice versa. And so they use this word non-dual to mean that which doesn't exclude anything, which, as it were, has no outside. As we say, space has no outside. You can only have outsides inside space. You can't have any outsides outside space. There is no outside space, even though space may be curved and finite. 